Mambo Beautiful Minds, and welcome back to another electrifying episode of Espresso Talk Today. I'm your host, Ama Robin, and today we're diving deep into the turbulent waters of racial isolation. But buckle up, because we're about to unravel the cloak of silence shrouding this unspoken struggle that many of us in the Black community, particularly Black students, face every single day. Imagine walking into a classroom, your presence a vivid burst of color against a canvas of whiteness. You can almost feel the gazes, the whispers, the curiosity that seems to pierce through your very essence. This, my friends, is the heart of racial isolation It's that feeling of standing alone in a crowded room, of being both seen and unseen, of having your presence questioned, scrutinized, and even rejected. This is racial isolation. Oh, we have so much to talk about today. But before we dive in, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you're feeling this episode, Share it with your crew, your circle, and everyone in your Awujo. That means community in Yoruba, the language, one of the languages of Nigeria. Now, let's close the door and get started. So what is racial isolation? I think you know, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. Racial isolation is the experience of individual Black folks or groups of Black folks feeling socially, culturally, or psychologically isolated when interacting or being in white spaces. It's a sense of feeling alone or disconnected, even though you might be surrounded by well-meaning people, even well-meaning white people, even if the white space is welcoming or not overtly hostile. Y'all know that I'm Black, of course. And that can feel, we can feel the aloneness in that crowded room. It's important to remember that racial isolation can occur in various different contexts, such as workspaces, educational institutions like the classroom, neighborhoods, uh, barbecues, entertainment venues, restaurants, or even just social settings among friends. Remember my experience when my friend was talking cheerfully about, in quotes, slave island and the shipment of, in quotes, slaves from the island? I didn't speak up and correct her, even though I really wanted to. Why not? I felt isolated in my feelings, so I didn't feel that I could speak up. And I was sitting there in a group of white people, all of whom were were friends, even close friends, I would say. But... As the only black person in the room and the only one with the family history of enslavement and that and racism, I was utterly alone. That's what racial isolation can do. It can make you, I mean anyone, feel weak or unsupported or like the outlier of the group, the other of the group. Because guess what? I actually was and I was acutely aware of it. Racial isolation is primarily characterized by the feeling of being the only one or the one of very few black people in a sea of white people. We'll talk more about this later, but let me just say briefly that this isolation can lead to a range of emotional, psychological, and social challenges, including a sense of alienation, reduce self-esteem, and the need to navigate complex racial situations related to identity and belonging. I mean, those are just really, that's a really complex way of just saying that, you know, you don't feel like you can be yourself out there and that you are kind of putting on a mask so that you can fit in. Well, and we've all been there and we have all done that and it isn't easy. And yes, it happens all of the time. I remember when I was practicing law, back kind of in another life, I would go to meetings where I would be the only black person in the room. And living in Belgium, I'm often the only black person in a restaurant or in a store or on the airplane. 
And guess who was the only person on the plane asked to show her boarding pass? Well, you know the answer. I used to try to ignore feeling the isolation, but it was 100% there even after I left the situation. Okay, some of you might be thinking, well, this is just another form of segregation. You know, that's a great thought, but it is not another form of segregation. Segregation is an entirely different beast. Racial segregation refers to a deliberate and systemic practice of physically separating individuals or groups of different races into distinct and often unequal spaces or institutions. This separation is typically enforced through the law or through the structure or through the institution, and it can result in a physical separation, which is the point, of residential and residential areas and schools and housing and public facilities, workspaces, and lots of other places. But it's also not a question of why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? It's not that kind of thing at all. First of all, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes, yes, but not always. And second, more importantly, this is a type, that would be a type of self-protection and self-care. You know, sitting together in the cafeteria, well, now you can all choose where you want to be. You're not, you know, assigned to classes and different classrooms and all of that. Now it's lunchtime or it's a break and you can all be who with who you want to be with. And often a lot of the black kids or the, or the kids of color or students of color will sit together. So this is a space where we can be ourselves and not have to justify our presence. Many white people at all levels, from students all the way up to teachers and to administration, feel very uncomfortable with black students sitting together and supporting each other. This is not self-segregation, it is self-care. It is a community. And by the way, white students often sit together in the cafeteria too, but apparently that's not a thing. Apparently that's not a big deal. So anyway, take that for what for what you want. But Racial isolation is about being the only one or the only black person in the room. And I have felt that so many times and I'm acutely aware of that feeling. I get it though. Someone does have to be the first one. Someone has to be the first. You know, we have worked and struggled and sacrificed to be in the room and to pave the way for other black people to be in the room too. And I praise those who were the first, but being a black person in a room full of white people is a special kind of stressor and its effects cannot be overlooked. They often are, but we got to stop doing that because we're feeling it and it is affecting us. We often do because it's, con you know, we're considered to have made it, I put that in quotes, or succeeded when we're allowed to be in the room, when we are listened to, when we are at the table. Perhaps this is true but it is not an easy place to be. Oh, do you remember Ruby Bridges? Ruby Bridges? Okay, then I have a little story to tell you. Now, perhaps you remember that picture of a six-year-old little girl entering a New Orleans public primary school. On November 14, 1960, Ruby was the first black student to attend that school. She was a cute little girl wearing a blue dress, a very smart blue dress and a white sweater. And in the picture, she's carrying a tiny briefcase as she walked up the stairs to enter the front doors of the white school. In front of Ruby were two federal marshals. There were also two federal marshals behind Ruby. They had been assigned by the president to protect, to protect her. Why? because the white parents at the school didn't want black students at their school. Ruby had received death threats. Yes, a six-year-old girl had received death threats, threats of violence against her, I mean, real violence and abuse, and her parents had been fired from their jobs. Awaiting Ruby at the gate on that fateful day when she's desegregating this white school in New Orleans, Awaiting Ruby at the school gates was a group of rabidly, and I mean rabid, I'm using, using this term correctly, hostile protesters, mostly white parents and children, plus photographers and, and reporters. 
They yelled names and racial slurs and chanted and waved placards. One sign read, I put this in quotes, all I want for Christmas is a clean white school. Another woman held up a miniature coffin with a black doll in it. Imagine, imagine that. Six-year-old Ruby was the only black student at the, pri the white primary school. Ruby was taught alone for the entire year. She was not allowed to play outside at recess, partially for her own safety and partially because the parents didn't want her playing with their kids. She sat with the teacher for the entire day. She wasn't allowed to play with, sit with, or talk to any of the other students. For the first year, Ruby needed federal protection. She needed these guards around her every single day since there were protesters always at the school gates, including the woman with the doll in a coffin. I used to have nightmares about that, Ruby said. This is a blatant example of racial isolation. Little black girl, segregated white school, racist environment, no friends, threats, afraid, isolated. But this is not really an unusual situation, you know, except for perhaps the federal marshals. There are other situations. Let's see, black student, predominantly white school, white teachers, white administrators, Eurocentric curriculum, quote unquote, colorblind school, few trusted friends, isolated, afraid. That's the story that is telling, that's being told and happening and lived today. The story keeps repeating itself. Ruby Bridges' example visually shows what being the only one can look and feel like. And by the way, I really strongly encourage you to see the iconic newspaper pictures and the normal Norman Rockwell painting of Ruby's first day. Now, Ruby is all grown up now. Ruby Bridges is all grown up now. In fact, she's in her 60s. And today, Ruby has written a book that discusses her memory of those days. It's called, This Is Your Time. I highly recommend this book because it'll take you back to those days which were actually not that long ago, and show you the courage and sacrifice that black people, adults and children alike, were living to fight, living with to fight racism and white supremacy. And that's really what it was. You know, or in Ruby Bridges' case, she just wanted to go to school, but she had to fight racism and white supremacy just so she could go to school. You can find her book, This Is Your Time, at the Expresso Talk Today bookstore. Highly recommended. Well, black people often feel this racial isolation in predominantly white spaces. Schools and workplaces are primary places where racial isolation is rampant. And no, it's not self-segregation, but it is white supremacy and racism. Let's open a window and take a breath for a minute. Trying to get a lot of dough, anything is possible. Turn me up in the headphone. Yeah. Grind it, get a lot of dough and dirt the water obstacles, cause anything is possible. Yeah. Oh man, I got a lot of gold. Stack that bread and buy my nose. Anything is possible. Yeah. yeah. Grind it, get a lot of dough and dirt the water obstacles, cause anything is possible. Well, welcome back. That last section was intense, I know, and that's why I felt it was important to, to breathe for a little while so we can come right back and come back stronger. I just told the story about Ruby Bridges being the first black student, she's six years old, at the all-white school in Louisiana. Hers was definitely a case of racial isolation, but unfortunately, racial isolation has not ended with school desegregation. Actually, racial segregation is really not ended in schools yet, but that's for another podcast show. Stay tuned for that. But many black students today go to predominantly white schools. The student body is predominantly or mostly or even all white. The teaching staff is predominantly or mostly or all white. Most of the black faces you'll see will be the sports coaches or a few black students sprinkled around or maybe a black teacher or two. From primary school to college and beyond, 
many Black students are experiencing racial isolation every single day. Well, throughout the show, you're, we're going to hear a few quotes from Black students that capture what racial isolation can feel like. So let's hear a few right now and you know, from these students who are experiencing the loneliness and alienation of racial isolation. Here's, here's the first one. I often feel like I, I'm on an island by myself. None of my classmates understand what it's like to be the only one who looks like me. It's a constant battle to fit in. Wow. Okay, here's another one. When you're the only black student in your class, you can feel like you're in a foreign land. You can't help but feel isolated and out of place. Can you relate to any of these feelings? I definitely could as a student. Looking back, I absolutely remember these kinds of feelings. And I still feel them now. I'm not in school, but I feel them in other venues, which we'll talk about later. But I can absolutely relate to how these students are feeling. These quotes give a glimpse into the emotional and psychological impact of racial isolation on black students. It's important to acknowledge and address these feelings to create more inclusive and supportive educational environments for all students. I know, I know, I know. Everyone uses those words, inclusive, supportive, diverse, but nothing ever changes. And black students continue to feel this way in school and beyond. And because you know, people say that, well, we're colorblind, there's, then there's denying that black students are feeling that way but that's their feeling. That's not how many of the black students are feeling. Here's the ironic part. This is really ironic. Going to a white school used to be the dream. Going to the white school in an upper middle class or wealthy neighborhood was the goal. You know, they have these great resources, the buildings look good, they have, they have all the, the internet and the computers and excellent books and libraries. Well, that's probably diminishing now, but if you could get into some of those white schools, you were almost guaranteed to get into a good college and your future looked bright. But we know that's not the whole story. The students that you just heard from tell the real story and you're gonna hear more from students throughout this show that are gonna tell you the real story. But students are not the only ones who experience racial isolation. Black teachers also experience it. Did you know that only 7% of teachers in America are Black? Racial isolation for Black teachers can manifest in several ways. Underrepresentation. As I just said, teacher Black teachers are in short supply and are often underrepresented in the teaching profession, especially in schools with predominantly white, white student populations. This underrepresentation can lead to a sense of isolation that they're the only one or one of very few educators in their school or even throughout their whole district. There's this lack of peer support. Black teachers often have limited opportunities for peer support and mentorship from colleagues who share their cultural background. And this lack of representation among colleagues can make it feel challenging to find mentors who can relate to their experiences and give good advice to. Black teachers also feel a pressure to represent. You know, they feel there's a significant burden to represent all black people positively. And this pressure can create stress and anxiety as they strive to break stereotypes and set an example for both students and colleagues. That's a heavy burden right there. It's kind of a form of tokenism too, I would say. The microaggressions and bias. Black teachers experience microaggressions, bias, and discrimination from colleagues, from administrators, and yes, even from their students. These experiences can also contribute to isolation and frustration and sometimes even fear because you know that no one's got your back. You're out there by yourself. And finally, there's kind of a cultural disconnect. In predominantly white schools, black teachers may sometimes feel a disconnect culturally with their students or colleagues. They may struggle to relate to certain norms, cultural norms or expectations, and that can also lead to a sense of isolation and 
that can also lead to some of these white pleasing behaviors that we've been discussing for the last few weeks and even racism denial. Yes, racism denial and internalized racism, which, which we've also discussed. So what do we have here? Black students feel isolated. Black educators feel isolated. Racial isolation is real, but yet it's still not acknowledged. And it's challenging. It is challenging students and teachers to accept what should be unacceptable to all of us. Racism and white supremacy in the classroom and throughout the educational system. There's white supremacy in education and black children are made to feel inferior. White children are taught in subtle ways that they are superior. Let's take a moment now to hear two experiences about the pressure to conform that many white student, many black students feel. Okay, let's see. These are quotes from directly from students themselves. I used to wear my hair naturally, but I started straightening it because I wanted to look like everyone else. It's exhausting trying to fit in and be quote unquote normal. Wow, wow, wow. Here's a second, another quote. I've had to change the way I talk and act to fit in with my white, co white classmates. It feels like I'm constantly putting on a mask. Again, wow, and I know that feeling. We've talked about wearing that mask, you know, that we, have, we keep it close to us so we can put it on at any time when we need to. And we wear it so much sometimes that we don't even realize we're wearing it anymore. Well, a few months ago, I remember dis I discussed my personal experience with racism manifesting as race racial isolation in the classroom. I was in my sixth grade social studies class, which was my favorite class at the time. Sixth grade, so I was 11 years old. The social studies teacher asked us to open our textbooks to read about black history. It was Black History Month, so that's when we got to read a little bit about black history. So what did we read? There was a paragraph. Now, okay, to be fair, there were two paragraphs in our textbooks about black history. Let's see, it was, the first paragraph was about slavery with an accompanying picture of enslaved black people working in the cotton fields. The next paragraph was a short paragraph about Martin Luther King's, his I Have a Dream speech, and that he had been assassinated. That was all. That was all we got in social studies. And that was it for the year. And that was all we learned. But the focus was on black people as enslaved people and how the good white people, quote unquote, freed us from slavery. By the end of that social studies class, the white students were feeling superior or have, for having freed the enslaved black people. And the black students were slumped over, looking embarrassed and feeling inferior. I guess they, they got exactly what they wanted. In this case, distorted black history, let's just say it untrue, black history was used as a means of racial isolation against the black students as a group. Yes, racial groups can also experience racial isolation too. Even using inaccurate, false, or incomplete information isolates students from each other and from their history. And it damages our self-esteem and separates us from our cultural roots and heritage. This social studies teacher who was white was probably unaware of how she was isolating and inferiorizing her black students. Well, I just get angry and I feel sad thinking about this, this incident. And I think about it often. I'm in my 50s now, but yeah, I still think about that and I can still feel it. And it was just one of many incidents. I get angrier and sadder when I think about what is happening in classrooms today when it comes to black students. Ron DeSantis, you know, the infamous governor of Florida, may be the narcissistic poster boy for racism and black erasure in the classroom, but he's not the only one. He's not even the first. It's been happening for a long time and it's happening across the country. Oh boy, it's getting intense now. Let's open the window again, fam, and breathe. Take a few breaths. Drown again.
Get a lot of dough. Anything is possible. Turn me up in the headphone. Yeah. Grind it, get a lot of dough. And dirt the water obstacles. Cause anything is possible. Yeah. Oh man, I got a lot of gold. Stack that bread and buy my nose. Anything is possible. Yeah. yeah. Grind it, get a lot of dough. And dirt the water obstacles. Cause anything is possible. Oh man, I got a lot of gold. Welcome back again. I hope you took some time to breathe just like I did. Let's get back to it. I have two, two more stories from two students talking about the lack of black representation in the classroom. You gotta hear these. Here's the first. I wish I had a teacher who looked like me. It's hard to imagine a future for myself in certain careers when I've never seen someone who looks like me in that role. Wow, that's right. Mm-hmm. Here's the second one. It's frustrating when the books we read in class don't reflect my experiences or culture. I feel like my identity is invisible. Again, wow. And I think Ron DeSantis must be smiling his weak butt off and Greg Abbott and Ted Cruz and Marjorie Taylor Greene and the rest of those fascist racists in power. They may have won this battle, but they're not going to win the war. Let's keep going. Okay, the consequences of racial isolation in schools are really far reaching. I mean, beyond what just being in that classroom for that day, or even staying at that school, or even up to graduation, the impact, this can have far reaching and long lasting impacts on students' academic, social, and emotional well being. Many students feel the social isolation. They feel racially isolated in schools and they feel lonely, alienated, and sometimes experience low self-esteem. We just heard that from students. Another experience is the psychological stress that can result from racial isolation, anxiety, depression, you know, uh, particularly when students are subjected to discrimination or bias, and it's scary to think sometimes even suicidal tendencies. Let me mention something that I don't think any of us or any of well, I think may be a surprise, I'll put it that way. Adultification of black children. Did you see that one coming? Did you think I was going to talk about that? Okay, well, it's, it's true, and it is traumatic. Adultification. Have you heard about the six-year-old six -year -old children being arrested at school? Let me rephrase. These were six-year-old black children who were arrested in 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 school, in their class. They were taken out of the classroom, sometimes in handcuffs by police who had been called by the teacher. And they were taken to the police station without their parents. What did they deserve, do to deserve such harsh treatment? Well, they might have been fiddling in their chairs, or they might have been watching other students misbehave. One was falsely accused of having a gun by a a white student in the class, but they were all arrested. You know, they were acting like children, six-year-old. They were just, you know, acting like children and they were arrested. Yes, and that kid did not have a gun in his backpack. One of the other students accused him falsely, but uh, they didn't have, you know, he, he didn't have any kind of, of gun, but yet he was arrested. That's another thing that racial isolation does. It makes black kids vulnerable to the racism, the racial bias, the discrimination, and the mistreatment and excessive punishment in the educational system. Those go mostly to black kids. Did you know that black boys are suspended or expelled five times more than white boys? And black girls are suspended or expelled at disproportionate rates with a suspension or expulsion on their records, sometimes starting at five years of age, black children have difficulty finding another school placement. And many times they're diagnosed with neurological disorders, behavioral disorders, mental defects, or even learning disabilities. Racial isolation makes black students vulnerable to their peers, their teachers, and to racist educational systems. 
Black students feel it, and white students feel their power in that situation. But what can we do? First thing is we have to fight racial isolation in the classroom for black students or and for black educators. But you know what? We are not alone in this struggle. Let's face it, there is an undeniable elephant in the room, a racial, even a racist elephant in the room. And it's high time that we acknowledge its presence. So let's grab your armor of self-awareness and let's march towards a, with unapologetic honesty. First things first, my warriors, first things first, acknowledge that racial isolation is not a figment of imagination. It is not paranoia. It is real. It's a tangible experience rooted in the systemic currents of our society. From the workplace to the classroom, from supermarket aisles to the halls of justice, the black community often finds itself in white supremacist spaces. And children are not exempt from this. Those spaces might just feel like normal spaces for people to live and work and play, but they can quickly become spaces of racism and danger and inferiorization. Remember, we talked about on other shows, we talked about hypervigilance. Well, people say, no, don't do that. Just, you know, try to ignore the racism around you. But that is not a total possibility and it's not reality. Hypervigilance is a survival skill that black people learn at an early age. It's unfair, but it is necessary because a predominantly white playground can easily turn into a group attack on an isolated black student or a white student accusing a black student you know, of, of anything. And that white student gets the presumption of belief. Or a black student can face police for taking a nap in a common area. Remember when that happened to the black grad student at Yale? A white student had called the police. The black student was awakened and questioned. Fortunately, no charges were filed against the napping student. I mean, taking a nap isn't a crime as far as I remember. No, no charges were filed, but they asked to see her identification. And she courageously refused to justify her presence on the campus. Still, there should have been charges filed against the white student who called the police. Didn't happen though. Or black students are arrested for not wearing quote unquote normal clothes. Or there was a black student who was banned from graduation because her hairstyle and clothes weren't considered acceptable. Or a black student was handcuffed and removed from the classroom after a disagreement with the teacher. Or there was a the six year old black girl was handcuffed and arrested behind her back for uh, uh, handcuffed behind her back and arrested for having a tantrum in the classroom. Her wrists were actually handcuffed behind her back. And by the way, this once happy child who loved to dance is now and still experiencing extreme PTSD. See, and she gets separation anxiety and she's developed phobias against simple things that she what didn't have fears of before. She rarely smiles. Strangers get a wary look and police officers terrify her. That's totally understandable. This happened in Florida. No surprises there. But I know that it's happening. It's happened in California and Texas and around the country. Schools are no longer safe spaces for, for students, for many black students. My point is that racial isolation, in addition to the mental and physical effects, makes black students of all ages unsa unsafe in predominantly white environments. This is reason enough to avoid actually predominantly white schools where your black child may be isolated and vulnerable. Let's bring it down a notch fam and let's take a minute to breathe again. I'll be back in a minute. I 
hope you took some time to breathe. We talked a lot about the problems. Let's talk, and there's definitely more we could say, but let's start talking about solutions. So what are some solutions? How do we conquer this beast called racial isolation? Well, my fellow crusaders, awareness is our sharpest sword. It's time to peel back the layers of that this onion and dissect the ways in which racial isolation infiltrates our, our lives and our society. You might think that is not too much, but awareness, in my opinion, is the first and most important step to approaching this problem or any problem. You can fight, fight something when you don't even know what's there. So raise your awareness, look around you. What do you see? How do you feel? Think about what's happening to you. Think about what's happening to others around you. It's time to take off the blinders and get real. That's an important first step. And it'll be a continuing step. This will be a step that never stops. Remember the hypervigilance that I talked about? That's a form of hyperawareness. So remain aware and remain vigilant. Because this is an empowering podcast show, an empowerment podcast show. Let's discuss ways that Black students who are experiencing racial isolation can empower themselves. I'm just going to mention three things that you can do, that students can do, but there are more ways and you can find them on the website at the Habari page. Self-reflection is the first one. It's very close to awareness. Time, take time to reflect on your experiences and feelings. Understand that it's okay to feel a range of emotions, including anger, frustration, sadness, and, and pride in your identity and heritage, culture, and blackness. Acknowledge and accept your feelings and emotions. Remember that you are not the problem. White supremacy and racism are the problems. They're the enemies. Number two, develop coping strategies. Try to do this proactively. Learn healthy coping strategies to manage stress and anxiety. These can include mindfulness techniques, meditation, journaling, exercise, or engaging in creative outlets like art or music. Be sure that these are healthy coping strategies for you. Why pleasing behaviors like telling racist jokes or laughing at offensive stories or changing your appearance or clothes to that you fit in or rejecting your culture are not, not healthy coping tools. So if you're a writer, take your journal with you to school. And you're feeling angry, you go ahead and write in that. If you're a musician, you know, listen to music, uh, take your guitar, li play music. There are lot, lots of different ways that are uh, coping strategies that are, that are healthy and effective. Number three, this one gets a little bit radical. Join or start black, a black student group. Get involved in student organizations or clubs that promote black empowerment. These groups can provide a sense of community and a platform for advocating for change. Seek them out in your school or start them if your school doesn't have one. They can be as formal or as informal as you like. Some schools might not like this. Why folks can get nervous when black people and black students are meeting, remember, in the cafeteria. So if this happens, meet outside of school. I remember in college and law school, there was the Black Student Association and the Black Student Union, and these were amazing organizations where I could just be myself, take off that mask, and feel safe and accepted. They also had really great resources, you know, for, for navigating these sensitive or racially charged spaces. As I said, there are other things that you can do. Check out the Espresso Talk Today website for more information. Well, since we are talking about students, I do want to discuss a few ways that parents can help their children who are experiencing racial isolation. First, engage in dialogue. Initiate conversations about race, racism, and racial isolation with your children. Encourage open and honest discussions about their experiences and observations, but listen to them. Listen to your child. Observe their body language and voice. And this will not be a single conversation. Instead, it'll be discussions, observations, and sharing, thought sharing. Be your child's support and advocate. 
and your child's safe space. Number two, promote parent-teacher collaboration. Establish positive relationships with your child's teacher and the school administrators. You may not like them, but you're going to have to deal with them. Collaborate with them to address issues of racial isolation and work together to create a more inclusive environment. They will probably say that, no, our environment is inclusive. You know, children aren't feeling isolated. I make sure to include blah, blah, blah. But but explain to them, tell them, and insist that this racial isolation is real and that they have to deal with it. And number three, be informed. Be an informed parent. Stay informed about the policies, practices, and initiatives relating to diversity and equity in your child's school district. Engage with the resources and organizations that provide guidance on fostering inclusive schools. Yeah, this is, you may just look at this and just shake your head. Also, stay informed about racially motivated or racist incidents in your child's classroom, school, and district. Stay informed about racist teachers. Collaborate with other parents to watch, report, and document racist, racist incidents that affect Black students. Look, racism flourishes when we are isolated and when we are uninformed. Form a Black parents group and hold the teachers and administrators accountable. Accountability is key. They hate that. Again, more suggestions are on the website. Take a look. But let's just hear, you know, one last group of... Uh, of quotes from students who have experienced this. And these ones talk about the emotional toll of racial isolation. Okay, let's see. It's emotionally draining. I carry the weight of being the only one like me every day, and it takes a toll on my mental health. Yeah, I get it. And here's another one. Here's the second one. Sometimes it feels like I'm fighting a battle all by myself. It's exhausting and it can be really lonely. No student should ever have to deal with this kind of situation or carry that kind of load. Educators and health professionals are always talking about student mental health. What do you think they say about this? They say absolutely nothing. Why? Because they don't even think it exists. But you tell me. We already know it does, don't we? And so that's what I said, as a parent, you're gonna have to be the one to really advocate for your child and make them see what they don't wanna see. Make these teachers accountable and see what they don't want to see and respond accordingly. I do want to mention that the HBCUs are also an excellent choice, an excellent choice for black students. They're amazing learning and academic institutions. Students will be exposed to black professors and researchers. They'll also meet other black students who share their interests and passions. And listen up, they will not be the only black student in the room. My friends and colleagues who have gone to an HBCU say that it was the most most amazing experience of their lives. They developed lifelong friendships and in their career too, and they always felt safe and valued. I've interviewed people who've attended HBCUs on this podcast show, and I can tell you, I am so impressed with what I've heard and what I've seen. If you want more information about HBCUs, look at the Espresso Talk Today website on the Habari page. You'll see it's the 107.org, and it, I was so jealous of their experiences. So let's wrap it up for now. I think it's time. It's been a lot of information. And let's do one last breathing session. We're back and this is our last segment. So we're in the home stretch, but you got to hear these stories from students feeling identity struggles. First one, racial isolation makes me question who I am. It's hard to feel proud of my cultural heritage when it seems like nobody else cares or understands. Yeah, I get that one too. Here's the last one. I've had moments where I've wondered if I should just try to be colorblind to fit in. 
but that's not who I am and it's not right. You know, most of us have tried to change who we are so that we'll fit in. Newsflash, it doesn't work and it only makes you miserable. Just look at Clarence Thomas. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist that one. But congratulations to the student who decided to the student who decided to be herself. This white pleasing stuff just doesn't work and it only makes you question yourself. So remember, my fellow warriors battling racial isolation, know this, you are not alone. Your experiences, your stories, your triumphs, they matter. Before we part ways today, let me just leave you with this. Racial isolation may be a formidable opponent, but it is not unconquerable. Armed with knowledge, empathy, and the unwavering support of our community, we can empower ourselves against the effects of isolation and even transform isolation into connection and growth and power. Well, that is a wrap for today's episode, y'all, and Asante Sana for writing with me. Remember, we're all in this together and we're not backing down. So remember, my fellow seekers of truth, change begins with awareness and unity is our goal. Of course, our ultimate goal is defeating racism and white supremacy everywhere we find it, which is basically everywhere. So don't forget to subscribe, to hit that subscribe button and share this episode with your fam and friends. And also please do me a favor and leave a review. Your reviews help me to know what you're thinking, what you would like to talk about, and how you're feeling about the show. I need to know, not for me, but for you, because I'm here for you. And if you want to keep discussing or just reading about these issues, then you should definitely subscribe to my weekly Black Empowerment newsletter, The Normal Beat. We discuss lots of different issues there. You can get your dose of Black Empowerment every week. That's never a dull moment but lots and lots and lots of growth moments. You can subscribe on the Espresso Talk Today website, espressotalktoday.com, or on Instagram at ama robin l. That's ama, A-M-A, underscore robin, R-O-B-I-N, underscore the letter L. I'm Ama Robin for Espresso Talk Today. And remember, now more than ever, strength, soul, and reparations. Ashe community.